I, uh, I, I only want to take a couple minutes from Judy's presentation today uh, to tell you about a new team here at First Church. Uh, I am really excited about it. I'm on the team. Yay. Yay. <laughs> there are six of us. It's called the um, Interim Transition Team. And we are going to be looking at our history how we've evolved to where we are now, and our hopes and expectations for the future direction of the church. And it's important that every person give us some input into this process. There are going to be opportunities along the way. There'll be small group um, get-togethers. There'll be some written questions that you can answer and, and return to us. You don't have to sign your name if you don't want to. Uh, you can talk one-on-one. -on -one. If any of you would like to talk with me, that would be great. I'd love it. Mm -hmm. Just set them up. <laughs> um, anyway, it's vital to this process that every voice be heard. And I hope that you'll take advantage of the opportunities as they come along. Uh, and I met Wally last night. Uh, he was at our team meeting. And I have to tell you that all the glowing comments that I've heard about him in the last couple of weeks are true. Yay! Yay! He is a really neat guy. He's easy to talk to. He's very engaging. And he's going to be a wonderful leader for us during this interim period. He listens well. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He listens very well. Uh -huh. Oh, good. And I want to remind you that we have no meeting in August, but we'll be back in September with our uh, last four programs of the year. They're not quite as good as today, but they're pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and as much as I dislike the phrase, our speaker needs no introduction. <laughs> in this case, it's really true. Uh, Judy's going to talk to us about the Civil War, uh, maybe remind us of some things that we've forgotten. I know that's hard to believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe tell us some things that we didn't know, you know from a new perspective. Thank you for being with us, Judy. First, first, I want to make sure that everybody can see the screen from where you're sitting. So there's a whole table up here that's empty, and you're welcome to move up here if you can't see. So today we're going to talk about the Civil War. But we're not going to talk about the battlefields. And we're not going to talk about the generals. And we're not going to talk about even the North and the South. We're going to look at the, at the Civil War in a whole different way. We're going to look at the Civil War from the perspective of how it changed our culture in one specific arena. And that is how it changed our, wait a minute, <laughs> how it changed our view of death. So return with me now to the Middle Ages. The Black Plague is ravaging Europe. One in three die. And some of the people, a lot of the people that died were priests. And this was not good because it meant people were dying without the benefit of last rites and a priest to be there to help assure that they went to heaven. The view at that time was that at your deathbed, demons came, demons came and tempted you with pride of the spirit. Now here we see a dying man and the demons all around, and they're, they're offering a crown, money, possessions. And here is Mary, Jesus, and God feeling sad because this dying man will probably not make it to heaven. So, to counterbalance the, that issue with no priests, two documents were written in Latin about how to die properly. <laughs> the good death. And, and if you 
if you find that hard to believe, I can tell you that right up until the Civil War, how to die properly was taught in Sunday school and in sermons. Dying properly was very important because it was part of going to heaven. Hard to believe, isn't it? Cannot locate the server, great. <laughs> okay. Let's see, let's try this. Okay. So, because dying was an art, what did we expect from the dying person? This is true, I'm not making this up. What was expected from the dying person was that they give up their soul gladly and willingly. That they, that they welcome, welcome death knowing that they're going to heaven. And that's part of the idea that you're supposed to go into your death the way you lived your life as a good Christian. <laughs> Kicking and screaming. Kicking and screaming, not exactly. <laughs> the second thing that was supposed to happen when you were dying is you were supposed to resist the devil's temptations. So on your deathbed, you weren't supposed to worry about who was going to inherit your property or your wife was going to marry, any of that kind of stuff. You were supposed to focus on heaven and Christian values. You were to pattern your dying on that of Christ suffer gladly and willingly and give your soul to God. And you're supposed to pray as you die. Tricky. 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 Yes, very, that's a lot. Depending on how you're dying, that could be a lot, couldn't it? <laughs> now the family had requirements in this because if there's no priest, there's the family. And here's what is expected from the family at the hour of death. First of all, you died at home. Have any of you, uh, particularly those of us who are older, have experienced having um, um, a body laid out in the parlor yeah. before death? Yes. Oh, before or after death? After, after death. death. And was the funeral held in the home? Yeah. Not so much that. Not so much that. If you have relatives back east like, like I did, did you notice that the, even if you never had someone laid out in the parlor, did you notice that the doors into the parlor were, were wider than ordinary doors? That's to accommodate getting coffin in and out. So you see, even up until fairly recently, we were still, we were still doing a lot of these things. Dying at home, with the family as witnesses, you're surrounded by your family, and part of the reason for witnesses is so that they can testify to how you died, that you prayed, and, and that you suffered gladly. My Are we to assume that if you did die this way, that it was taught that it was sin and you could go to hell? Kind of well, we'll talk more about that. Okay. Because as you can imagine, in the Civil War, a lot of people didn't die like this. Yeah. Uh, this is why it caused a cultural shift for us. The family was also to record the last words of the dying, and then to tell them as family lore through the years. Now remember in the Bible, the idea of, in the Old Testament in particular, there was not a belief in the afterlife. So when you died, what, what was your inheritance? How were you, how did you go on? Through your, your descendants. Through your descendants, specifically the men, right? And what was the responsibility of the family, the men in the family in particular? To remember your name. You know how many times in the Bible it's got lists of names? You know, like this is somebody's this is somebody's lineage, da 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 generation after generation. That's your eternity if you don't have a heaven. And that's part of what 
recording the last words of the dying work was to help keep them remembered and alive. Now, the Civil War cost more American soldiers' lives than almost all other wars combined. This is the Civil War. This is World War II. Here's World War I. Some of these are. The Revolution only, only took 4,400 people. This is over half a million people killed in the Civil War. And how, what was the total population of the country? That I don't know. I don't know. But here's Iraq and Afghanistan up until fairly recently. But the Gulf War only took 300 people. Neither the North nor the South was prepared for this kind of, of a problem, either in terms of medical care or in terms of death. They, nobody was prepared for it. So it became, it became a, a cultural catastrophe. Wasn't that because of, there were just way more ways now to kill somebody than the, the, the yes, the killing the, machines were way advanced of the uh, yeah this, medical the, the Civil War is considered the first modern war in that regard. Two thir but two thirds of the people died were killed by disease, mm -hmm. and part of that is because germ theory was not widely accepted, and anesthetics you know to uh, to put you to sleep while they took your leg off, they used whiskey, chloroform, or ether. And this is a picture of a field hospital. So you can see a lot of the wounded would, would have died. Union Surgeon General George Adams wrote, the Civil War was fought in the very last years of the medical Middle Ages. So while it was the first modern war in terms of warfare, guns and things like that, it was also the last war of antiquity. I mean, using whiskey as an anesthetic. And, and operating under these conditions, you'll see he's got on his street clothes, he's wearing his hat, his beard is uncovered. He probably doesn't even own any gloves. God forbid he washes his hands. Yeah. Civil War's soldiers' chance of, of not surviving the war was one in four. <laughs> there were a lot of ways people died. On the battlefield, in the hospital, of disease, in prison camp. Lots of ways that people died. And, and these are the soldiers we're talking about, not the townsfolk. Because if you visited the battlegrounds, like Sue told me that she has, you know that the war raged in towns, in fields, in, in back of farms. So civilians were big numbers of the casualties. Starving. Hunger. Star yeah, starving, because Sherman's did everything. Starvation, yes, starvation, and prison camps, starvation was a big issue. Now, when the, when the Civil War began, the Federal Army had 98, 98 doctors. And the Confederacy had only 24. And we're talking of a, a war toll of half a million people. Well, one of the things that they had is woman power. The North and the South were assisted by thousands of volunteer women. And there's one very famous that you'll recognize, Civil War nurse Clara Barton, who founded the Red Cross. <coughs> what happened to her is she asked for permission to meet a train that was bringing in, in wounded. And because uh, she was a nurse, and she went out there and she discovered they didn't have any resources. They didn't have medicines, they didn't have bandages, they didn't even have beds. And the more she thought about it, the more she realized something needed to be done in a, in a, in a national, on a national level. And of course, her work in founding the Red Cross is still important worldwide today. Yay. 
When did Florence Nightingale? Florence, Florence yeah, I think she was earlier. Okay. I don't know how much earlier. Yeah, that that was probably during the American Revolution. Yeah, maybe that. Claire Park. <laughs> now, a big problem, and now we're getting to your question, Mike, about about the debt. A big problem for the families was they're still clinging to the good death, remember? Mm -hmm. And these people are not dying at home. And, and they may not be buried in an honorable way. And how we didn't get their last words. And this, and this young man writes, this is not how we bury folks at home. <laughs> these are soldiers' graves. And what you can tell by looking at this, or how they did this, is they would dig one grave and then the second grave and use the, use the dirt from the second grave to cover the first one and just down the row. But what these are, these are soldiers from our site. The enemy soldiers that were buried, they often put in mass graves. And they weren't very deep, they almost looked like a bunker in graves. Well, part of the problem is that, that you have to wait till the battle is over before you come in. And, and if it, the battle goes on and on and on, and there's few people left, and people are tired, and it's dangerous, it becomes a real problem. And the governments were not prepared for this. Casualties Mountain, they, they, it, they had to abandon, totally abandon the concept of the good death. But the soldiers tried to hang on to it. If you had a friend in the, in, who was fighting next to you and this person was wounded and dying, you would, you would listen closely to their last words, write it down, and if you could <coughs> later, send that letter to the family. So the family would have the last words. And very often what you would do is say, I buried him under the oak tree on the Gorman farm, which is three miles from Hillsdale at the, at the junction of the creek. And then the family would come and try to find the body to take it home for proper, proper burial. Judy, does the Ars Moriendi stand for the proper way to be buried? The art of dying. The art of dying. Yes. Uh, years ago, I read a book uh, about, we all know that the, the Quakers are pacifists, and that they were also patriots. And while they didn't believe in the, in the war, this book was about how there were bands of Quakers that followed the military and their, their purpose was to bury the dead, and uh, uh, it was really a, a huge effort. I mean, yeah, it would have been a huge effort yeah. under there dangerous were, circumstances. And there were a lot of people involved. In it. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought about that for years. Which is, yeah. Which you it's all your fault. Answer her question: Thirty-one million population. What? Oh, the population of the United States at the time was 31 million. Identifying the dead was another big issue, and, um, and, they, and they wanted to return the dead home if possible, so that the family could be properly notified, so the body could be buried in, in the, uh, the family plot. But it wasn't always possible. And the, and the government was not responsible. Today, we take it for granted that the whereabouts of every soldier, dead or alive, be known. Have you been reading recently, just this year, a number of Vietnam casualties have been unearthed yeah. and returned and buried in uh, Arlington 47 years after their death? Yeah. Our government spends $800 million a year looking for lost soldiers 
for as far back as World War II. So today we take that for granted, that the whereabouts of every soldier be known, that the family be notified, missing in action or dead or wounded, that the body be returned if possible, and that the government is accountable for this responsibility. This is a whole new concept. We don't, we don't think about it. We read in the paper that, that these Vietnamese uh, casualties are returned home and we say that's, you know, that's wonderful. Yeah. We don't think about it. The invention of dog tags. Dog tags were invented and first issued to the military in World War I. Prior to that, in the Civil War, what soldiers did is they would carry in their pocket a letter from home, a small photograph, a Bible that had their name and address in it, something that so that whoever found them would be able to notify the family. Oh, that's what I just said. <laughs> the, the wealthy soldiers created their own dog tags. And here's an example. This is Benjamin Gifford of Company 2 of the 121st Regiment of the New York Volunteers. So he created his own his own dog tag, and um, dog tag engravers were uh, on the on the edges of the of the of the moving army, so that if you came into a little bit of money, you could get a you could make your own dog tag. Do you know why they were called dog tags? No, I don't. Well, weren't um, soldiers in World War II were called dog faces, weren't they? But World War One, they were called doughboys. I don't know. I just wondered where the, you know, where the term dog no, tag. Well, they look like nowadays. They nowadays, but the dogs didn't Well, that's tags. nice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> even, with, even with these precautions, more than half the dead were unknown. Enter the undertaker. OK, so if you're going to be killed on the battlefield, but the, everybody wants you to be returned for proper burial, that's a technical problem. <laughs> Advances had been made in Europe in embalming, but it hadn't come to the United States. Now it comes to the United States. And this is an embalming um, clinic, which was shack, <laughs> in the field. So em embalming, because the whole idea was that you should get home looking enough like yourself that the family would know it was you. The other problem is, with or without embalming, how do we get your casket home? Here is a typical, this is a modern contemporary reconstruction of a Civil War wooden casket. A very plain, very plain indeed. Companies in the north and south followed the battlefields and developed businesses in for the safe and sanitary transportation oh, home. Sanitary. <laughs> it's as good as it got in, in the Civil War. If you had enough money, you could afford a metal, a metal casket, but that cost about fifty dollars, and that's a lot of money in those days. <coughs> The government did not provide any services for getting people home, either locating the, the dead or getting them home. And that's why you would write down where somebody, you buried somebody, and then the family would come and try to find you. I always wondered how people just left the battlefield to go bring in the harvest and then went back to war, you know, because they're not being kept track of. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Wait, say that again, Cynthia? The soldiers routinely left and went back home to do things like bring in the harvest. Right. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered how they could do that, but here it is because they're not being kept track of it all. They're not very well. Not very well. <laughs> oh, they, if they were walking, they might have been reported to well, unless they were given permission, because I know yep. that was uh, it, what they suspended the Revolutionary War during 
harvest time. Yeah. Just, okay, we gotta go get the crops in the daytime. Yeah. Walt Whitman uh, had a brother and he was wounded and Walt went to visit his brother in the hospital and he was horrified by what he saw. Did any of you see on the 3rd of July this year the um, Gone with the Wind was on television? Did you see it? One of the scenes in that movie that just is so powerful is when Scarlett goes to the hospital and it is the train station and the camera is uh, up in the sky, and the camera pulls back and back and back, and you just see more and more and more wounded lying on the train tracks, more and more wounded. Well, that's what he experienced when he went to find his brother. He found his brother. His injuries were minor, but it was so upsetting to Walt Whitman that he decided he had to do something. He did an incredible amount. Yes. I visited Gettysburg, and I think that I came away with the idea that most of the people were just buried in the dirt. Yes, a lot of them were. A lot of them were. And mass graves, too. Yes. He, he developed systems to track bodies and families. He spent time with the wounded. He wrote letters home. He offered compassion. He listened to them. He brought food. He, he, I had no idea, he was an amazing man. He wrote hundreds of letters home to families to tell them where their loved ones were and what their conditions were and how they died. And, and he reassured people when he could that they had spoken of faith and family as they lay dying, which was an assurance of the good death. They died properly. That must have taken a terrific toll on his soul. Oh, wow. Did he write the poem then, oh, Captain, my captain? Did he write that at that time? Yes. You old-time poets? Okay, Gene knows. <laughs> so the legacy of the Civil War in the area of the culture that surrounds death for us today is, it seems unimaginable that the government would not account for each soldier even 47 years later. We expect it. We expect that funeral homes will manage the dead and that funerals will take place away from the home. It was a whole new concept. We are not surprised if death occurs not in the home but in the hospital or hospice. At the beginning of the Civil War, fewer than 15% died away from home. During the war, a half a million died away from home. It changed our culture markedly. It brought in the funeral in industry, the mortuary, the undertaker, the hospice, the deaths in hospitals. We still live with the legacy of the Civil War in ways that we are just not fully aware of. Hospice is really involved though in, in keeping it in the home. Mm -hmm. Hospice, and the hospice movement goes back to the Middle Ages as well. Oh, so, nice. oh it's very, very old movement. So, that's the, my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Question. <laughs> Did any of you in your families, or do you have family members that knew Civil War soldiers? My, mo my mother's grandfather lived with them, and he had been in the war. What, what is your experience? Well, uh, we had a... Uh, a large, I, I grew up in St. Louis, and uh, in the community where I lived, uh, there was a large family that um, uh, some of them had been slaves, had actually been slaves. Uh, I remember a couple of the old men who were very, very old, near, near 100, that 
had been slaves and had bought in the, you remember Missouri was, was split mm -hmm. half, half and half. Uh, and uh, this family was very proud of their Civil War uh, heritage and so they would show up at public function, they'd be invited, the old men would be invited to relate stories. And, and That's so when you were a kid? They, yeah. yeah, that was when I was a kid. Yeah. Anybody else have a story to tell? I have uh, my late grandfather and my our late grandmother both died at home. Died at home? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Grandpa died in 39. I was about a year and a half. He died in October. He was 60 years of age. And Grandma Rhodes also died at home in 1947. And they both had cancer. Mm -hmm. And that was the early stages well, of it. I'm sure they died the good death. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. <laughs> uh, speaking of, of the good death, my father would not die anywhere but at home. So mm -hmm. we had to keep him there. And, he, and uh, we weren't all on very good terms, but oh. we were there. Yep. <laughs> we were there. And because, in, I don't know, we felt we had to, that this was part of what you did. Yes. Although my mother had died in the hospital a couple of years before. But it was something we felt we did. And my father said, um, not too long before he died, thank you for being here. And it was the first words of acknowledgement of love that we'd heard from him in, in years. And it was like, oh, this is wonderful. And then I experienced him actually leaving the bond, but that's another story. But that was, uh, the, now the undertaker, the uh, mortuary were not happy with us because he was sitting in his easy chair. Uh-oh. <laughs> and they didn't, you know, they made us go outside because, and, and, you know, I came back in as the oldest one there and said, you know, why can't we witness this? And he told me, because we're going to have to scrunch you down, down and it's going to make noise and you're going to freak out. Yeah. Oh, okay. you say smashing That's what she said. <laughs> what does that mean, smashing down? Well, but, but you That's notice what she said, though. This is the way he died. Oh, oh, you're bigger and She yeah. said that, that, um, they felt like they had to be there. And I think that's part of this legacy of the good death is that the, the concept of, you'll read it in the obituaries even now, he died surrounded by his family. Yeah. Yeah. That's a legacy from the Black Plague in the Middle Ages. Isn't it interesting how deep culture goes in our lives without our even knowing it. How many goes further back than that? Uh, you know, just as long as human beings, since they were doing the cave paintings, you know, there's always been a sense of, you know, some sort of ritual or... Yeah, but to a certain extent, um, it, we don't have, in prehistorical times, we don't really have a witness of that. But this is, this is a document that tells you how you're supposed to die. <laughs> Mike. I was with my mother when she died, thank God. Um, I value that very much. And I was there and I stayed to, to witness when they put her in the shroud, they wrapped her in the shroud, and uh, I prayed over her and blessed her. The shroud is another is another thing that goes and back. I, I just consider that whole time very special. Oh. I think about it quite often. Well, you know, it, before the Civil War, not only did you die at home, but your family prepared you for burial which is similar to what the, what the women going to the tomb were planning to do for Jesus, wasn't it? They were going to anoint his body and, and make sure he was clean and, yeah. and all of that, uh, that stuff, put spices on him. Um, and that, that whole thing happened in the home right up until this time when there were so many. And in some places it continued on, but it began to fall away after the Civil War. Yeah, when uh, one of the ladies in Jesus' time, when she was putting oil on his head, yes, and he told uh, Judas, say, hey, Judas, don't do that. 
Yeah. <laughs> She's preparing me for my burial. He did indeed. He did indeed. Good for you. Yes. Yep. Um, one thing about dog tags, I know at one time they used to have a little indention in them, and I was told that was because uh, if you have a lot of deaths, we would put that dog tag in their mouth, and they would know that's where to, where to, where to, find, where to find it. And uh, another thing, my my mother, although she had gone, gone to a hospital where we, we were so rural that it was like 30 miles to the hospital, but my mother had been in a hospital, but she decided she didn't want to go back. And uh, we had an old, old nurse in the, in the community, and that nurse then came and uh, stayed with her until she passed away. At home, and I can still remember my. Also, my sister died when she was 21 years old. She was an older child, and I was the youngest. Uh, but I can still remember. It was it. She was put in the parlor, mm -hmm. and uh, my sister Kate, who was closest to her, just two years younger. I can remember Kate going in and looking at Betty and, and crying and running upstairs. So mm -hmm. it, it was really a traumatic thing to happen in the family. I mean, you, you wanted to have them in the family, in the house, but it was traumatic to have them. Yeah. And thinking about, could you sleep at night? I, I was so young, I could. <laughs> well, it's what we did. It was the way it was done. So I don't think, well, if you were young, it might have been scary, but for the adults, it's it was their duty. Yeah, they died. Any other? Yeah. I was just thinking while you guys are talking, in the 20th century, uh, you know, like speaking as a baby when we're here, they're, they're, it's become so detached. I mean, I, you know, people used to die at home and stay at home and be handled and touched. And I know what I'm sorry about. I was one of the few kids I knew that had been to a funeral. Now, even if I had a city kid, I'm sure it was a different world. But, and everybody would get creeped out at the thought of going to a funeral. Never bothered me, never asked it, you know, being, being around somebody who's died or, you know, it's like our society became much more detached. It became, it became a distant thing. Yeah, somebody took them The more took, took yeah. them away. And but I can remember my mother did with the children going to funerals. Yeah, and, and I know. I it had to do with the death of her mother, who was in the home and, you know, Laid out, and yeah, that's why they're in therapy now. Finishing. <laughs> <laughs> campus, which was a retirement community, and so we had a lot of funerals. And in the three years that I was there, we never once had a funeral 
at which the body was present. So it's, it's becoming more and more that the body doesn't even come to the funeral. And we're different here in Arizona because fully uh, um, two-thirds of the people that die in Arizona are cremated. And a large part of that is that we have so many people from other places that it, shipping a body somewhere is very expensive. Shipping ashes is a lot simpler and less expensive. And so we, that's part of the reason why we have so many cremations here in Arizona. Um, but so we have a different culture here even than in some parts of the country. I wanted to ask some of the members that have been here a long time. <laughs> uh, my grandmother, we were going to this church in 1954 when my grandmother died. And I have no recollection of any service at all um, of her. But we were members of this church and I'm sure that there was a service. It could be that we were not allowed to go that because could be. we were children. But did they have, what, what was her name? Who else was here? What was her name? Uh, Macy Foreman. Might be in the records, church records. Yeah, it might be in the church records. No. Yeah. Was anybody no, here I in, in 1954 to remember? I was what I was going to do. Well, Corrine, 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 were you here in 1952? Yeah. No? Yeah. I became a member of Resource at the newspaper. Yeah. Over the internet in the newspaper. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and it's got uh, the sources of this information. So if you'd like to uh, look up any of this or read more, it, it's available here. I'll be glad to give it to you. And uh, Ken Burns has a documentary called The Civil War. Oh, yeah. And that, it's like four or six hours long. Yeah, it's, yeah. Long. Yeah, it's on Channel 8. Yeah, but it, it, it's intense, it's factual. It's and excellent. It, it was so overwhelming, we had to watch it in segments. Yeah. Very small. Small. It, it features Shelby Foote, who is a preeminent uh, Civil War scholar who died yeah. fairly recently. The, the Civil War period was the first time where the military had officially designated chaplains for the military uh, in the Revolutionary War, War of 1812. Uh, they had chaplains, but they were just sort of volunteer to follow the army. But uh, during the These Civil the War, it was the, was the first yeah, time in where Jesus they was in the White House. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shall we? Francis uh, Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner. Shall we? Shall we offer grace for uh, for yes. what we are about to receive? Dear and loving God. We appreciate this beautiful day, even though it's very warm. We're glad to be all together in a, in a friendly and happy gathering of friends. May the food nourish our bodies, renew our spirit, and the conversation cheer our hearts. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.